or a film crew uh, that was at one of Hin's meetings. Yeah. And um, you have this story about this uh, boy. Yeah. And Boy, that, that's hard for me to tell. And I mean that seriously. It's very hard to, to recall that. But there was a boy, a little kid, maybe about seven or eight, I would guess. Um, his parents were carrying them in, his, in their arms, and he was dressed in a, in a blue, dark blue jumpsuit. And he was out of control. He, he might have had cerebral palsy. I don't know. I'm not a medical person, so I, I couldn't diagnose that. But he was uh, you know, throwing his head back and forth and screaming and that kind of thing and flailing around. And they were trying to control him. They couldn't get through to the stage. Mm. Because people's, uh, Hins people keep anybody in a customized wheelchair, which means they can't walk without it. Uh, and anybody who has obviously serious problems, like a missing leg or something like that, they're not going to let them anywhere near the stage. And certainly they were keeping these people back. And the husband and wife, um, uh, friendly mother and father, rushed with the boy at the guards and really pushed them aside, just like a football play ran up to the stage right in the middle of well, Benny was carrying on up there with uh, preaching some obscure point from the Bible and they charged over to him and the man grabbed the microphone from Benny Hinn and he said, Reverend Hinn, heal my child. I brought this child here. I've gone 20 cities following you around, <coughs> pardon me, trying to uh, get up on this stage and they won't let me in early. I want my son healed. Heal him in Jesus' name. And hand him back the microphone. And Hinn was very cool. Now, he's a professional. He's an actor, and he knows what he's doing, mm. and he's used to this kind of thing happening. Mind you, this tape will never reach the air. Uh, I'm sure that was erased immediately after it. But huh. what happened was he said, Jesus, heal this boy. Everybody in the eyes said, heal, and they all yelled, heal, and hallelujah, and whatnot. Heal him now, if you will, Lord, or heal him tomorrow, or next week, next month, next year. Whenever your will says he will be healed, he will be healed. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus handed the kid back to the parents, and they rushed them off the stage. And from where we were with the cameras, we could see them going down the stairs. They were bullied by the, the guards who lifted them off the ground and put them outside on the street and slammed the doors behind them. That was well out of sight of the audience, of course. The audience couldn't see that, that mm. angle at all. That film, videotape, pardon me, that we made at that time was never used mm. because Hen made very big noises about... Uh, about being uh, uh, suing them for, for libel and slander and all that sort of thing. And mm. uh, they feared it enough, apparently, to not use that part of the film. Unfortunately, it was very rich film and very true, and it showed what Benny Hinn is really all about. Yeah. Now, this shows, well, it just illustrates uh, some of the dangers, doesn't it, uh, oh, it does. of this type yes, of yeah. uh, business. And um, it is dangerous. It's dangerous to the lives of the people who depend on this for healing and it's dangerous to the sanity and the emotional security of people who choose to believe in it. Because mm. often they're invited to, to toss their, their medications oh, aside. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, and, and Peter Popov and Benny Hinn, I've seen them do the same thing. Where they say, throw those medicines up on the stage. Now, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, a fellow named Shaw, is a, an ex-pharmacist um, mate in the Navy. So he knows uh, pharmaceutical compounds. And we picked up a whole bag of these that were thrown all over the stage after one of the services. And he found uh, oral insulin in there. He found digitalis. Mm. He found nitroglycerin tablets. Now, these are things that people need to survive if they have attacks. They must have them or they will die. And that was the kind of thing they were throwing up on the stage. How many of those people died afterwards? We have no idea. Mm. Absolutely amazing. Well, of course, there's other folks on TV who are out there uh, uh, swindling and uh, making their money. Mm -hmm. And um, they're purporting to talk to dead people <laughs> yeah. and uh, bringing messages back from the other side. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of current crop that's uh, popped up on TV in the past year or two. Um, have uh, John Edward, mm -hmm. um, Sylvia Brown, um, James Von Pra. Yes. Um, Gosh, I think there's even a pet psychic out there who talks yeah, to animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> like Dr. Doolittle. Well, I can tell you one thing. The astonishing thing is that the dead, they turn remarkably stupid after they die. My grandmother, when they call up the ghost of my uh, paternal grandmother, she doesn't remember her own name or where she was born, what country she was born in, or what language she spoke. It's funny how their memories fail as soon as they're dead. They, they really turn into total idiots. And the interesting thing about the dead that, that people like Von Prague and, and Sylvia and, uh, and John Edward, of course, call up 
is they never give them anything important. They never come back and say, I want to tell you that the will is on the bookcase behind the encyclopedia on the third shelf. No, they come back and they say, I'm with you, and I love you, and I'm happy in heaven. Next case. Mm. And they, they give them pap. They give them nothing meaningful whatsoever. And yet these people are reduced to tears because they think they've made contact with the dead. Mm. It's a game of 20 questions. It's a guessing game. And if you take very, care very careful attention to the videos that you see of these people and actually record them and start to do a count on how many times they're wrong, it's astonishing. They're far more often wrong than they are right. Uh, you appeared on Larry King with uh, Sylvia Brown. Oh, many times, yes. And uh, uh, I understand that she's agreed to take your million dollar, million dollar challenge. Well, I can hardly wait. The only problem is that was like 300, it, uh, going on 340 days ago now, I think. I've got a, a clock. You go to my webpage, which is www.randy.org, and you'll see the Sylvia Brown clock right there. Hmm. Her face right in the middle of it. And it tells the number of days that have gone by since she agreed to take the million dollar test on international television all over the world on the Larry King Show. It's seen in every civilized country in the world on CNN. Hmm. She agreed to do it. She said, first of all, after the first couple of months, I don't know how to reach Randy. You didn't have a hard time reaching me, did you? <laughs> no. Anybody out there, put me into Google. I show up like that. I'm easily available. I got a phone number. I'm in the phone book. I got email. I got the web page. I got everything going. And Sylvia Brown, the greatest psychic, she knows psyche things, but she doesn't know how to use the phone book, apparently. And I could tell her, <laughs> in, in 20 minutes, I could probably train her. If you can get a chimpanzee to do it, I'm sure I can get Sylvia to be able to do it. <laughs> but she can't find me, she said. Well, mm -hmm. now she says she's found me, but she hasn't got time. Anybody who hasn't got the time to make a million dollars, I think, are intellectually challenged. And if she says, I don't need it, well, then she can give it to AIDS victims, to hungry children, to the homeless. There are lots of things, Sylvia, that you can do with that money, but are you out there? Are you going to do it? I don't think so. We'll never hear from Sylvia. Mm. Absolutely amazing. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the uh, James Randi Educational Foundation. Okay. Um, when, when was that founded, and what prompted uh, you to start that organization? Well, it's been going for five, going on six years now. It's located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and our webpage tells the whole story on it. Um, a very uh, wealthy gentleman came to me and said, you know, you should have a foundation going for you, and he gave me the funds to start the foundation. And uh, we set it up there in Fort Lauderdale. We have our own headquarters, and we get a lot of visitors coming through Fort Lauderdale, and they look us up, and they come around, and uh, we uh, entertain them, we talk to them, we uh, usually get them signed up as members. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but our biggest audience is literally from the web page. We get over 19,000 hits a day on the oh. web page. Now, that's a very large number, Tony. I think you'll agree. Well, that's amazing, actually. It is amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, we are pretty well a web page entity now. Mm. We've got a very large library. We've got a media library. We've got videotapes, hundreds of hours of videotapes from all over the world of famous psychics doing their things and getting caught at them. Mm. And anybody who'd like to drop by, we are very happy to sit them down for a couple of hours in the video room and let them watch these people make fools of themselves. So mm. we act as, a, um, as an exchange uh, uh, center for information for the media and for students and scientists and researchers of various kinds, and particularly for young folks who are doing school projects and whatever on these things. Mm. We get these people by. And by the way, locally here in this area, during my, my meeting at uh, Da Vinci Days and everything, I've met a couple of young folks that are something else. Mm. I mean, uh, one kid I spent several hours with last night, an amazing guy who just came to me with his, with his eyes shining, so to speak. I never knew there were other skeptical people in the world. Huh. Now that's refreshing and frightening. Mm. And frightening, and, and rather, it, it brings a certain amount of despair to you. 